brought to you by Burr Foreman and broadcasting live from the Business Radio X studios in Atlanta, Georgia, it's time for Results Matter Radio, where we bring you pertinent business information and offer real-life solutions to help drive desired results for you, whatever your business may be. Lee Cantor here with Stone Payton, another episode of Results Matter Radio, and special thanks to our sponsor, Burr and Foreman. Stone, how are you doing today? Good morning, sir. I am doing well, and I am jazzed about tonight. We're headed over to Athens to a facility called For Athens, F-O-U-R. I think it's an incubator. We're going to get a chance to do a remote broadcast and get to know some folks because we have some designs on uh, putting up a studio in Athens maybe as early as next quarter. That's right, and uh, we are big fans of the startup community in any market they happen to be in. And as many of our listeners know, a great deal of my money already goes to Athens at the University of Georgia. This is her last year, so a shout out to Katie. Maybe we'll get a chance to see her this evening as well. Is that true? You got that schedule? Yeah, I think maybe. All I right, think she's cool. going to slide by. Maybe we'll let her do a couple of interviews. There you go. <laughs> but uh, this is going to be a fantastic segment this morning. A little bit later in the program, we're going to get a chance to visit with the VP of Sales with American Eagle Financial Services, a guy by the name of Lloyd Lofton. And we're going to talk to a chartered financial consultant, Mr. Charles White. But first up on Results Matter Radio this morning, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce partner and director of business development for Bedford Cost Segregation, Please join me in welcoming to the broadcast, Miss Debbie Rodkin. How you doing, Sunshine? I'm great. How are you? Doing well. Delighted to have you. Cost segregation, not a phrase that Lee and I throw around a lot in everyday conversation. Uh, what is it and why do people need it? I can't understand why you don't throw it around <laughs> all the time. I feel like I'm missing out. You are so enthusiastic about it. It's <laughs> such a great concept. <laughs> Cost segregation is a strategy to accelerate the depreciation of buildings with the sole purpose of lowering income taxes. And the savings can be hundreds of thousands of dollars, depending on the scope of the property. Is there a size property that this works best with, or a, a value? That's a great question. And if we had this conversation eight years ago, I would have said yes. <laughs> <laughs> However, times have changed, and we've been able to streamline our processes and significantly lower our fees. And so now what I consider even smaller companies, and it's not really so much the company as the, the cost of the property, right. are able to benefit as well. And it's not just property owners. It's the tenants also. If the tenants paid for the leasehold improvements uh -huh. of the space they lease, they can take advantage of cost segregation too. So how far back can you go for this kind of thing? So can you go back years on this? Years. Any building that was built or construct or, or acquired or renovated since 1987 is still eligible for accelerated depreciation. Now, it doesn't mean it always makes sense. Right. What I do is I gather lots of information about the scope of the property and analyze it and determine if that property is eligible, and if so, to what extent they might save. And then we are able to make a recommendation to the property owner or to the tenant as if they should do cost segregation or not. So in order to do this study, are you just doing studies all the time or you don't start a study until somebody hires you? Well, I'm in business development, so I'm constantly <laughs> having conversations with property owners and with tenants and with CPAs about their properties, about mm -hmm. what they want to do as far as business. Do they have a desire to sell the property, in which case maybe cost seg does not make sense, but it might make sense for the person who's going to buy it from them. So now we just call it cost seg? Cost seg, <laughs> so, exactly. Okay, so because we're in the club now. We're so in the we club. Also, so cost seg. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we, we do a lot of conversations, and we, we really try to consult with our clients rather mm -hmm. than just say do this and collect information. We want to make sure that it's the right – it's the right study, and it's the right um, process. But can you tell at a glance if it has a chance to, to work out? Like, what information do you need kind of a superficial level to kind of know that, that, that it makes sense a little bit? If the property has been placed into service already, meaning it exists today, mm -hmm. then I like to look at the detailed depreciation schedule because that will tell me when it was placed into service and the cost basis and any renovations that might have been done. I also ask the type of property, the square feet, how many buildings, how many stories, how many acres, mm -hmm. what's the purpose of the business? Is it a restaurant or is it a doctor's office? Mm -hmm. Is it multi-tenant or single tenant? And once I know all that information, I can help put together a benefits analysis showing the specific savings and make a recommendation to the owner or the tenant. So is a big part of your job education, or do most people in the, in the arena, they already know about this? 
I wish everyone knew <laughs> more about cost segregation. There are a lot of misconceptions. So let me state again, any property that was built or acquired or renovated since 87 is eligible. It doesn't have to be new construction. Wow. But yes, new construction is great. It doesn't have to be old. But yes, acquisitions work. It can be something that's just a renovation. It could be just a tenant improvement. And here's the kicker. You do not have to amend returns. And that is the biggest question I get is, oh, my gosh, I'm going to have to amend returns all those. No, you're not. You file a Form 3115. It's an automatic change in accounting, which means you get all that catch-up depreciation you've been entitled all to in all these shot? years in one shot. Wow. And for those financial planners out there, <laughs> <laughs> a shout-out. Um, it's a great opportunity. You save your client. We save your client about $300,000, and then they ask you to invest it. So the return on investment is uh, this money that they're going to get as a product of, of working through this process with you, just contrasted against whatever the fee for the study is, and it sounds like it's uh, usually a pretty handsome ROI, huh? The ROA is ridiculous. Yes, ours is only a very small flat fee based on the scope of the study itself. Right. Um, so an average fee can range anywhere from, say, $5,500 to $9,500, and the average savings is usually fifty dollars to $350,000 in the first year. So what's been your record first year? Well, let's see. I sold a project last night. I sold another five this year. No, but what's the most <laughs> amount of... Um... Oh, my gosh. I have no idea the most amount because it, every, every, every savings is going to depend on the property. So we have, we have performed studies on properties as small as, say, a dental office that's $175,000 mm -hmm. in basis, up to office buildings that are $400 million. So obviously the $400 million right. dollar <laughs> client gonna is going to save significantly <laughs> more than the small dentist office, but it doesn't mean the dentist isn't going to save. Right. It's still going to be worth their time to go through the study. Exactly. And it's good for every property type. So just to give you some examples of just how far ranging, this could be good for assisted living facilities, apartment communities, child care, school facilities, um, restaurants, doctors, dentists, um, self-storage facilities, warehouses, office, retail hotels, you name it, we can help. And don't forget the tenants also. So are you reaching out to these people that you just described as a large part of your day, or are you spending most of your effort working through other um, professional service providers like the CPAs and the financial consultants? I get 90% of my business from CPAs, but oh, four wow. months out of mm -hmm. the year, it's tax season. They won't talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> so I've had another probably a week right. to, uh, to, or so to talk to CPAs, so and then I'm direct. cut off till April 15th <laughs> is over. Um, that being said, I am we, we are giving presentations to a number of different CPA societies and to CPA firms within just the next two weeks alone, talking about cost segregation, talking about these new repairs and capitalization rules that have come out. So there's always changes yeah. In our industry and the CPAs, I mean, it's so difficult to keep up with this one little thing when they're trying to keep up with And everything. you're a specialist in this. We are the spe that's why they call Bedford, because uh -huh. we know exactly what's going on at all times in this area of specialty. Now, how did that come about? Like, what made you go deep dive in this one narrow um, area? Well, it's a niche area, and right. it's always nice to have something that is a specialty. But well. that was a choice, right? At some point, your firm said, you know, we could do 50 things, or we can do we can be best in class in this one area. What yes. made you just say, let's just focus like a laser beam in cost seg? Well, Bedford was formed back in 1987, and their sole purpose was... Coincidentally, you know, that's the year that you can start doing all this. Coincidentally. <laughs> however, we weren't doing that. We were actually financing... U.S. post offices at the time. The company was called Bedford Capital. Uh -huh. um, but then that contract ran out, and my CEO is an engineer by trade, and he said, you know what? I want to get into the cost seg business. So starting in 2002, we were a cost seg firm, and that is our area specialty. We do other things such as 179D energy efficiencies where we can get up to $1.80 per square foot of tax deductions for properties. Um, we can do research and development tax credits, but our bread and butter, cost seg. So your personal backstory, how did you land here? Tell us a little bit about your career path. Oh, goodness. It was a dream, a little girl. You're like, one day I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll be, be the cost seg. seg. I'll be the cost <laughs> seg queen. If somebody had told me eight and a half years ago I'd be selling cost <laughs> segregation studies for a living, oh, yes, and loving it. And, and I could tell I you love it. I mean, I love this business. It's so interesting. <laughs> you, how, I don't know. I mean, obviously, in your business with interviews, you're meeting so many interesting people. But every day I talk to smart people. I learn something new at least every month, and I help people save millions of dollars. It's a great business. Right. But how do I get into it? I used to sit where you are. My my major in college actually was radio and TV with a specialization in radio. My grandmother once told me I had the perfect face for radio, <laughs> so I believed it. 
<laughs> and then I fell into property management and managed departments for seven and a half years, mm-hmm. five of which was with Trammell Crow. And I said, you know, I need to do something else. My properties ran like clockwork. It was a really interesting <clears throat> industry, but I was kind of bored. I knew everything there was at that time right. about property management. I said, I want to do marketing. No one would hire me to do marketing, even though I marketed my properties so successfully. So I went back, got my MBA in marketing, got my ideal job, and hated it. What was the ideal job? Well, my ideal industry was the CPG industry, consumer packaged goods, and mm-hmm. I loved it. But the company I worked for was a data, I was being a data analyst. Ah, okay. I, I'm not really a, oh, a data that analyst. Was, right. But my clients like me, and I love them, and I really liked the industry. Uh-huh. It just wasn't a good fit for my skills and personality and what the job entailed. So that ended. I tried to figure out what I wanted to do. I still wanted to do marketing. I ended up um, working for a company, organizing and planning their networking events. And then when that ended, because the CEO was hired by Donald Trump during The Apprentice, <laughs> um, that organization ended, and I got all these emails from everyone in Atlanta. Debbie, where are you? We need you. When's your next meeting? And I thought, oh, my gosh, I'm needed. How exciting yeah. is this? So I started my own organization called Refocus on Careers. Uh-huh. And for 10-plus years, I had monthly networking meetings, bringing in speakers, talking about whatever the business wow. topic was, and really grew it from an unemployed focus to a networking focus where 85% of the people at our events were employed. And so last year I decided I need to take a little break and refocus on me. So I decided to only do career coaching on the side and have some referrals groups and have some mixers. Um, but in that area, so I started that in January of 2005. And then in August of 2005, I had been working for another company. And my former coworker called me up and said, you need to look into this cost segregation. I said, what did you just say? <laughs> so you, you had no idea. That. You had heard of it never, or you had never. not even a clue? Not a clue. And she said, oh, it's accelerated depreciation. I said, whoa, <laughs> I know what accelerated <laughs> is when you drive a car. Right. I know what depreciation <laughs> is when you buy a car, but I don't know what the two is together. And she said, oh, don't worry about it. You'll be working with CPAs. And I went, oh, I don't know if I can talk to CPAs. They know so much about finance and I know right. nothing about finance. And she said, no, it's interesting. Look into it. Oh, my gosh. It was so interesting. So I thought, you know what? I'll give it a whirl. Why not? Eight and a half years later. So you paused the other thing? You stopped doing the network? Or you still do that the on the side? The focus is still on the side. Yep. So you still do that? I still They're do it. Still it's not as much. Not monthly events, maybe quarterly events? We have st- quarterly events. Um, so as, and we have referrals groups every, every other week. So... It's, wow. it's still going on. It's just not so monthly. So it's the best of all worlds, Best huh? of all worlds. I get Bedford for a living <laughs> and refocus to for... help others. Wow, that's great. So the selling and marketing, are you finding that both the direct client and uh, the folks that you're working through, the, the professional service advisors, are they embracing this idea initially? Yes. Or do you meet with some resistance? Or what, what is it like out there on a day-to-day basis just when you first introduce the idea? Well, you know, cost segregation luckily has been around for a while. So in 2005 and six, when I was first hired, we did a lot more education about what is cost segregation, why is it now the buzzword, and why are people taking advantage of it? Oh, yes, and why can CPAs not do this in you know, CPAs are really, really good accountants, but they're lousy engineers. And this is an engineering focus. So it's mm-hmm. an engineering-based methodology mm-hmm. whereby they go to the buildings and they analyze all the parts, and they're trying to move as many of the assets to shorter lives. So all buildings are depreciated over 39 or 27 and a half year lives. But really, there's parts of the buildings that can be depreciated over 5, 7, or 15 years. And so it's my engineer's job to go in the building, analyze it, and de- decide what those assets can be right. that can be accelerated, and write a report. And that's what the CPAs use. And so there's not really resistance, except it's just maybe they don't remember that they don't have to, um, they don't have to uh, do any type of. So they just returns. hire you. You do kind of all the heavy lifting, all the work. right? And yes. then you give them a report, and then they just take that report and then pop in some numbers in in their program, and it gives them exactly. We can provide everything also in an Excel spreadsheet, and boom, all they have to do is upload it. So, right, so, so it's turnkey. Yeah, so I'm what, these networking meetings. So sometimes, do you focus them on CPAs or some of these folks? <laughs> I have like the CPA circle or something. Um, no, so I don't really do them? that. <laughs> she doesn't. Right? Uh, she doesn't cross pollinate. I oh, very okay. rarely cross pollinate. <laughs> although I will say, in the past couple of years, I did start to say, "Okay, can anyone tell me what I do for a living?" Because I think people really didn't know that I had a job. 
<laughs> well, they see you, you know, in we this one role. Ex- ex- I'm sure you do. I'm sure people have no idea that you have a real job and that you would do other things. So right. it's and, and most people, I mean, let's face it, most people don't just have one job anymore. Right. We have mul- we all wear multiple hats. Sure. So I happen to wear two hats, but cost segregation is what I do for a living. So I, I prefer talking about that when I'm talking about business. But depending on the person who I'm talking to situation, sometimes we end up having a different conversation than intended. So where can our listeners go to learn more? What's the best way to reach out and have a meaningful conversation with you about this topic? Call me. My number, (laughs) 404-643-9456. I'll say that again for those of you listening who didn't get a chance to write it down yet. Debbie Rodkin with Bedford Cost Segregation. If you want to email me, drodkin at bedfordteam.com, 404-643-9456. Can't wait to help you save money. And that's bedfordteam.com is the website if they yes. want it. And I'm sure there's information on the Tons website. Tons of information. Kind of, and then you want to talk to every CPA in town. I want to talk to every CPA <clears throat> in this country. In the country, not just Atlanta. Not just Atlanta. So a lot of your business is outside of Atlanta. We have clients all over the country. All right. Well, it has been an absolute delight having you in the Thank studio. Thank you so much. This is fun. Yeah, it was a real shot of uh, enthusiasm and inspiration. we got to have you back sometime. I think it would be fun to do a segment and have you come in with uh, maybe one of your clients, one of your you local clients. You save some money. You that have anybody in town? Oh, my gosh. I have tons of clients in town, clients and CPAs. So, right. sure, anytime. Yeah, we'll do a segment. Okay. Yeah, you up for that? I love it. All right. You going to hang out with us while we visit with our next guest? Oh, I'd love to. Thank you. All righty. Next up on Results Matter Radio, we have with us the VP of Sales with American Eagle Financial Services, Mr. Lloyd Lofton. Welcome to the show, man. Thank you very much. I appreciate being here. Well, we are delighted to have you. Did you learn anything in that last segment? I was thrilled to follow Debbie. I think she's an interesting business. I have some uh, business partners that have done a little bit of that in that marketplace, and I think it's a great opportunity. I mean, really what I heard you describing, Debbie, was businesses that want to grow, but because of the economy uh, or their financial situation, they don't really see the ability to make an investment to grow. And now you've given them a way to do that. What you've really done is found lost money. Go ahead. You can comment on that. (laughs) She's speechless. I don't know. We should take a picture of that because I bet she's not speechless very often. That's kind of what we do. We go into retail merchants, and we help them find, you know, it's most most people go in and talk to a merchant about credit card processing or things like that. They talk to them about saving money, you know, and which means they think the the business owner's role is to manage expenses. Well, you don't grow a business by managing expenses. You you grow a business by by managing growth. And what I heard you saying is you go in and you help businesses find lost money, money that's already there but they didn't realize it was there. And then use that to grow with, right? It's an interest free loan, basically. Yeah, exactly. You have yeah. money out there rather than give it to the government. You can use it yourself. You'll pay the government eventually. But let's postpone that payment for 20 years. And that way they can, you can invest it for them and they can grow that money. But the hard part about that, I think, or at least in my experience, and, and see what, if, if this makes sense, is people are afraid of the unknown. They're afraid of what they don't know. So, you know, like in my business, it, small business owners get a million people coming in wanting to sell them something. They can always save money on credit card processing. They always got great loans for them. All these things that from the business owner's point of view is an expense. And they don't talk to them about the thing that matters most to them, which is making money and growing. So it's kind of hard for business owners to, to see the framework of, of in our business, it's, it's lost sales. It's how many customers walk out and don't buy because they don't have money or credit. And in your business, it's how many business owners want to grow and don't realize that the extra cash is sitting there and they're they're letting Uncle Sam keep it. So mission and purpose of American Eagle, uh, who are you out there serving and what are some of the services that you're bringing to them? Well, we do three different things. We, we work with uh, small business owners and retailers on credit card processing, uh, loan programs for the business and for consumers. Uh, we offer marketing programs to help drive floor traffic to the business. Um, if you don't get floor traffic, you're probably not going to make any sales. And then we have a training component where we help the small business owner train their point of sales people to convert that floor traffic to paying customers. So most small business owners, most retail owners um, have, are looking for four tiers of revenue from customers. They want the customer to pay in cash because they get all their money up front. Right. They want them to put the, the purchase on a credit card because they get all their money up front. Uh, they want them to get financed because they get all their money up front. And then they all have a fourth tier of revenue. So our finance programs would be that fourth tier revenue, and that's people that don't have money or credit to make a purchase. And then we give them some financial tools that give them the opportunity to do that. 
are businesses that are looking to grow, and because of their own um, uh, challenge in the economy today, you've got a lot of good business owners out there that have been hurt by the economy. Their credit's been hurt. Their business has been hurt, and they're lacking ways to get financing to grow their businesses, and we have tools to provide that. And then we have a marketing component where we can help the small business owner drive floor traffic to their business so that it becomes a package program for them. It's not a, a one-stop shop where they just do financing, and now they've got to figure out how to get people into their store. So we have different marketing programs that let merchants drive floor traffic. And typically what's missing for merchants, you know, if you're an auto repair guy, you've got an auto repair business not because – you necessarily want to be a great businessman. It's because you like to fix cars. Uh, it, you typically hire people that manage the business part of it. That also means that you're probably not a professional trainer. And the truth is, if you don't train your salespeople to convert your floor traffic to paying customers, you're probably not going to make any money. And that means you have to understand the type of customers that come in. Uh, almost every, every small business owner, every retail merchant out there has two kind of customers. They have an if customer and a uh, a, a how customer. And if customer, someone has the cash or credit to make a purchase from you, and they're just deciding if they're going to do business with you. <clears throat> the how customer is someone that wants to make the purchase from you, but they're not sure how they're going to pay for it. I did, I'm going to use that. I really like the way that you delineated that, the if and the how. I'm going to use that in my sales presentation. Yeah. Well, as long as you give me credit <laughs> for it twice, you can own it. I'm, I'm going to say, I'm well, the that. first couple of times I'm going to say, as my good buddy Lloyd Lofton always says, and <laughs> yeah. then I will have said it several times, and then I'll say, as I always yeah, say. Yeah, there you go. There you go. No, that really, that is a fabulous way to, to describe it, that dynamic. Well, like you know, if you, if you look at it, I always talk about um, – uh, marketing your, your business or your product uh, to the consumer and the way they make the purchase and on the things they use the most in the order they use it. So a small business owner, when a consumer comes into their store, uh, we went through the four tiers of revenue. But their point of sale people aren't trained to figure out which customers fit into what bucket. Well, there's some very simple questions you can ask. We have uh, Petland of Kennesaw is one of our a client. So it's very easy for them to ask, you know, what concerns you more, the cost of the puppy or how you would pay for it to get your new family member home? That's a real simple question. And if people say, how do I pay for it? Well, what they've just told you is that they either need to get finance or use a fourth tier of funding. So it's just some real simple question. We call them reductionism. You ask questions to reduce it to the dominant buying motive. And for the other side of this, for the small business owner, is they might get a lot of financial options into their business, gift cards and loyalty cards and things like that. But if they don't know how to, con if they don't know how to bring the traffic into their business, then 90 days later they become the 90-day wonder. You know, you wonder what happened to them because they quit using your product. So it really is about financing for the business owner and their customers. It's about bringing customers to the merchant, and it's about training their point-of-sale people how to use our tools in order to make more money. And, and truthfully, you know, I'm married with six kids. I don't really care whether you use my product or not because what I know is once I put my product in your store and you start let, give me access to train your port and sell people, if your revenue goes up, you're going to see that's because of me. And at least 25% of the time, you're going to use my finance products, and I'm good with that. Now, when you say retailers, are you primarily working with the mom-and-pop one-off retailer that has their own business or their entrepreneurs, or are they franchisees or both? Well, I really – that's a good question, Lee. I really uh, – say small business owners and, and, and retail, just to kind of target the business market. We have lawyers that use our program. Uh, Mr. Transmission uses our program. So it's, it's a whole variety of, of type of business, but it can be anybody. I mean, like I said, lawyers use the program because people come into their law office and, and they don't have the, um, the retainer agreement. Right. They have a need for a lawyer, but they don't know how to finance it. Well, you know, yeah. I mean, they, if, if someone goes in, for example, to a, a criminal defense lawyer, they might not have the 2500 to put down as a retainer fee or the $3,000 to put down the retainer fee, but they could pay $250 a month to the lawyer. So if the lawyer doesn't have a way to capture that client in the way that they can pay for it, then that's lost business. So that's our approach. We go into uh, any type of merchant or small business owner. I don't go in there and talk to you about um, how to – how to save money because that's managing expenses mm -hmm. or how to make more money. I want to go in and figure out the money you're losing now. So, you know, how many people come in each week and um, end up walking out of your business because they don't have uh, the money to make a purchase? How many come in and walk out of your business because they don't have enough credit left on their credit card? How many do you try and upsell and they don't have good enough credit to get finance for it? Well, let's say that that's 
10 people a week. That's a small number, but let's say they say it's 10 people a week. Well, what's your average ticket price? $400. So they have 4000 a week, 16000 a month, almost 200000 a year that walks out of their business. So the acquisition cost is zero. They're already in their business, right? Right. That's the hard part is getting them in the door. Yeah, right. They're in the business. They're walking out. So if I can show you how to capture 60%, just 60% of that business, I'm going to increase your revenue. How much is that going to increase your revenue? Right. It's 60, your 60%. So free three, money. Yeah, I'll pick up $3,000 a week, $12,000 a month that you're losing anyway. So the question I ask them is, uh, how much is your advertising budget? Let's say they spend $1,000 a month for advertising. If you could reposition, good word in your business, right? If you could reposition 10% of that $100 a month into a finance program that captured 60% of the people that walk out and they made a purchase from you, here's, here's the two things that you know for sure. If they make a purchase from you on one of our six-month programs, at the end of six months, they're debt-free. It's not like putting it on a credit card at 24 or 28% interest. They're debt-free. And the second thing that you know is in that seventh month, if, they're, if they've been paying $125 a month out of their monthly disposable income to pay for that, in the seventh month, what do you know for a fact? They got $125 They got $125 a month, else. yeah. So now you go to drip yeah. marketing, and you market into that home right around the time that they would be making a purchase anyway. It's mm -hmm. all about lifestyle issues and, and the time frames people are, are making purchases. And you, you figure out how to market to people at a time they're going to make, make a purchase anyway with money that they have available in their monthly disposable income. This is really hitting home for me because it's time, uh, my financial planner says, for us to do one of these irrevocable trusts. And Katie just turned 21. We want to set her up as the executor. But it's 2500 three grand. Um, and, I mean, we've got some options. And I don't know. I might take advantage of something like this. I mean, what, we're three weeks after Christmas, right. you know, and then I got, you know, I got to spend money on coffee every morning. Maybe I don't want to write a $3,000 check. Maybe I would take advantage of it. What you, you keep calling it a fourth tier? A fourth tier of revenue, yeah. Right. So I, I mean, mean, it's kind of like people use Title Max and people use those kind of funding programs right. at the time that is the most devastating emotionally and financially for them in their life. So they're the people that, you know, they don't drive five miles to Publix to buy their groceries, they stop at the corner convenience store, and they pay twice as much for a gallon of milk as you and I might pay. But that fits into their lifestyle. They probably don't have a checking account, or if they have a checking account, they don't have a credit card. That fits into their lifestyle. But that's a revenue stream that walks in their store every day and walks right. out because they don't have the money or credit to make a purchase. I mean, it's kind of like our, our parent company is an, is an insurance brokerage. That's kind of how we got in this, is the insurance industry ch started changing back in 2010, and we said we need to have – other revenue streams. We have need to have other ways to service our customers. Well, the hard part about getting people to buy life insurance is you're asking them to, to find new money in their monthly disposable income mm -hmm. for a product that they may, I may not believe in. If I can help you find money you're already spending, like if I can show you as a business owner how to change the deductible on your commercial auto policy or take a car that you've got listed as commercial and put it on personal vacation <coughs> because you only use it in the lumber lot, and we can take that, reposition that savings to get you a product that's going to help protect the finances of your business. I'm not asking you to spend new money, right? I'm asking you to reposition the money you're spending anyway. That's kind of what you do, Debbie, right? You go in and you show them the money that already exists, and you just show them a different way to use it. So it's, it's kind of like health insurance. I mean, what's great about the insurance industry is the government does all of the advertising for us, right? <laughs> <laughs> you don't need to market health insurance anymore. I don't think people so. Call people you up know like about crazy. it. Yeah, people call you up for crazy. But the, the, crazy part, the crazy part about it is people's concern about, about health insurance is paying the premium for it. Right. Well, if someone's turning 65 and their wife is 62 years old, there's three things you're going to, you know they're going to do almost without exception. They're going to sign up for Social Security. They're going to automatically be enrolled in Medicare. And 80% are going to buy a Medicare supplement. Well, where are they going to get that money? Well, the husband and wife have been paying for health insurance for 40 years. Even if they have group right. coverage, they pay for dependent coverage. So all they're going to do is reposition that money from their health plan over to – so that's kind of the concept when we got into the, the small business world for financing and marketing. And the truth is the reason we, we, we packaged the, the training part of it is our early failures. I mean, I went door-to-door. -door. That's how I started in the business, the door-to-door -door insurance salesman with Combined Insurance Company in Alton, Illinois. <laughs> wow. Back in 1977. <laughs> you do that a little bit, and selling's uh, in the future a lot easier. Oh, we're no, not kidding. You, we know, call you don't it, want to do that anymore. We call that walking and talking, <laughs> not smiling and dialing, let me tell you. <laughs> so 
I, I'd go door to door to businesses and I fell on my face. Well, what I, what I realized is that I was trying to sell them a product, which in their mind meant that they had to spend new money right. for a new product. So once I helped them find the money that they're already losing, the second thing I started learning is about 90 days after they had our product in the business, they'd stop using it. Well, why? Because the business owner quit being concerned about how to use the product, and they went back underneath the car. They went back to working with the pets. They went back to the things that they got in business for. Right. They didn't get in business to market my product to their point-of-sale people. So we realized that we have to start training these people. We can't depend on the business owner to do this. I mean, in the insurance world, we, we call that sending out an unlicensed agent. You know, that's when you, you go to a, hus- <laughs> a home with a husband and wife, and the husband says, well, I'll tell my wife about right. it. Well, you just sent an unlicensed agent out to market your product. How stupid is that? That's not a good plan. Yeah, so we decided we need to add training to this. We need to create a a packaged product so that the merchant can have their finance program, their marketing program, and their training program and walk away from it. It's turnkey. gives them the opportunity to pick up more money. And then the phone calls that we get are they want to do more training, not less training. Because the more training to do, the more their employees use our product. And the more their employees use our product, the more money they make. And like I said earlier, I don't really care whether you use my product or not. I know that 25% of the time you're going to use our alternate form of funding for your customers, and we're going to make money. And if you increase sales because of the training we give your point of sales people, you're going to attribute that to us anyway. Right. Now, uh, in your business, you're helping this retailer um, get the most out of everybody that walks in the door, right? True. Now, are, you're not really helping them get new people in the door. The right. marketing part of it does that. Okay, so, so you have a, a marketing element that helps them get attract new people in the door, and then your training helps them uh, get the most out of all of the people that come in there. Convert it. Yeah, right? Exactly. So now, we, we it, give them a three-foot uh, and a six-foot banner to put outside their business. Uh, we provide trifolds. We have uh, email drip marketing programs. We have coupon and loyalty And this programs. is all included in your service? Or well, they're, it, it they're paying. They're, this is they can get this kind of expertise for a fee. The basic program comes with basic marketing, uh-huh. and then they can pay uh, $19 a month. Right, extra if they want to get more extra stuff. Marketing, yeah. Now, in your business, do you have a place where people are coming in? Like, how do, do you use the same marketing uh, technique for your own business? Uh, we use the we use the marketing part of it to to grow our business. So you have a sign and you have trifold brochures. That's we, what you do for yourself. We do well. We do mostly website, uh, email marketing, and then we have salespeople. About forty salespeople around the country. And your your lead or the, one of the first things that you do is you put this training program into place. Well, the first thing we do is we do what we call a lost sales analysis. Okay. We have to figure out how much how many sales you're losing right now. Because the truth is, if you're not lo- if you only have one person a week walk out of your business because they can't make a purchase from you, right. you're probably not going to be interested in, in our product anyway. Mm-hmm. We might we might do a marketing program for you. We might do some training program for you, but uh, a good part of the time you're we're, you're probably not the right merchant for us. And, and that's actually a good thing. I mean, I don't I don't think you should pick up a customer because you can pick up a customer. Right. I think you should pick up a customer because it's best for the customer. Right. It's a right fit. Right. That's yeah, what exactly. you're looking for. You're looking for the right fit. I mean, my grandma always used to say, if, if it's an increase, you should consider it. If you're going to stay the same or it's a decrease, you, maybe you shouldn't do anything. Mm-hmm. So if we can't increase your business, you probably shouldn't be doing business with us. And, and that makes sense to me because I'd, I'd rather have you say, you know, hey, thanks. You did a great job, even though I didn't do business with you, and get me a, and be an influencer into other small businesses sure. than to become a customer of mine. And then 90 days later, you're not making money. And, and what are you going to say? Well, this product doesn't work. Well, it's not my product doesn't work. Either either wasn't right for you to begin with or you're not using it. And that's usually the, the situation. It's either not right for you or you're not using it. Now, what, what's an example of a, of a customer that you have that, like, did they, a lot of people were coming in and not buying? Like, is that common? Well, for example, Mr. Transmission. You know, a lot of people can't afford to get a three or $4,000 transmission job fix. And, and, and what a couple of our uh, uh, transmission customers were doing is they would let people make a down payment and then make payments on the car, but they kept the car behind the chain link fence in the back of their shop. <laughs> Until yeah. they could pay it off. Until they could pay it off. Oh, wow. So that's so, not really serving anybody. Well, on the one hand, I mean, it's really nice for the business owner that they're willing to, to take that financial risk. I mean, they have to put the money out for the parts and the labor. On the other hand, for the customer, they don't really have access to the car until they right. can pay it off. So if, if they can use our product and write a check for 25% down, and then make a monthly payment over three, six, or 12 months and be able to use their car at the same time. And then we fund the merchant 100% up front. Right. So that's a win-win win for everybody. It's a win-win for everybody. So now they had a large percentage of people that that was – like, is there a – what's the tipping point where um, – what percent that come in and walk out without buying? 
Well, we always do fit. that lost sales analysis. So how many people come in and, and leave because they don't have the money? How many people come in and leave because they don't have the extra credit on their credit card? How many people get turned down for financing? Like a lot of dentist office and doctor's office, you'll get a lot of that. People will get, will get either turned down for financing or they don't have the, the money to, to make the copayer deductible. If their deductible's $2,000, they don't have the $2,000. So the sweet spot for you are medical offices? Or you don't um, have a sweet well, spot? Well, any, any, any small business that provides a, uh, a service or a product that's over $400. Right. So it has to be over $400. That's the, you have a profile, right? Correct. For your well, we, absolutely. We have a profile of the, 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 the right type of merchant Right. So it's us. over $400. They have order. to be in business a year or longer. And you, need, you really need to have more than four people a week walking out of your business because they can't make a purchase because mm-hmm. of money or credit. If it's not four or more, it, it might not make sense for you. Right. It, it might make more sense for us to help you learn to market the right kind of customers. So if you have you know, 10 to 15% of your customers are walking out of your business because they don't have money or credit, it might be that you need to market to a different customer. Uh, if that 10 or 15% is pretty consistent for you, you know, you're the corner, you're the, the corner carpet store that's been there for, for 10 years, and, and you've seen a change in the type of people coming in and can't make a purchase because of money or credit, maybe maybe our finance product, maybe our 50% finance product will work better for you. Mm-hmm. Um, and we need to merit, marry it with a, a marketing program. But I'm not going to come into your business and talk to you about a finance program without knowing. <clears throat> First, you have to do this research, you. right? You have to know that We'd, you have to get the data so you can. Yeah, give we'll them. do a lost sales analysis with you right there. And, and, you know, from just a sales point of view, if you're not willing to sit down and do the lost sales analysis with me, you're probably That's not, not a good not fit right merchant. there. You're not going to use my product. Right. You're, you're not going to let me come in and train your people. You're not going right. to train them. So the, the process itself by determining how much money you're losing from, from the people you bring in anyway kind of pre-qualifies the type of merchants we'd spend time with. And, and really, once we get a merchant on board, we tend to have a lot of success with that merchant because they see us as a subject matter expert, and they don't have a problem letting us have access to their people. We're ha- the reason we want to get with your people is to make you more money. We only make money when you make money. If you don't make any money, we're not going to make any money. And then it, so- it sounds like your service is very sticky. So once they start doing this for 90 days, they get past it and the training's there and then they see it coming. It's not something that they would get rid of then. They're going to stay with it for a long period of time. That's true. Most of the time. The, the periods of time that they're going to quit using it is when they have staff turnover. Mm-hmm. So if you mm-hmm. have a retail business with 10 employees and they lose six employees in a 90-day period of time, that means that 60% of their employees don't know anything about our program. Right, so you're back to square one again. Right. So we have to watch those numbers. We watch the numbers that come through. We watch the utilization. Uh, and, one, and once we see a utilization well, you go down, you can see it's red over. flat. You can see where Absolutely. the red flags are. Yeah. And, you know, business owners love it. I mean, that's what you should do if you're providing a product right. or a service. When you call a business owner and say that I see your utilization has gone down 25% in the last 90 days, talk to me about your staffing. Because that's usually what it is. They'll tell you, yeah, you yep. know, you're right. I've had three or four new people come in. I've been thinking, you know, thinking about calling you. I just haven't done so it. So now it's time for more training. Exactly. Right. Exactly. The lost sales analysis alone has just so much uh, standalone value. And then to have the training right behind it, I think it's We've, fantastic. We found a lot of our business partners, and, and maybe Debbie and I will talk later, a lot of our business partners <laughs> actually pick up our concept of the lost sales analysis. Yeah. Because what makes sense to, what makes sense to business owners is how can I make money? Uh, and I'm not saying this to be disrespectful of any business, but what happens a lot of time is businesses that have salespeople that go out and sell their product, the training for the salespeople is to talk to, to merchants about saving money or managing expenses. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't know one business owner that got in business to save money. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. I mean, I think all business owners are in business to make money. Sure. So right. if, if they're going to save money, I'm going to do what Debbie does. I'm going to go to the CPA. I'm going to go meet with the CPA, show the CPA the lost sales analysis, and ask them which of their businesses they think would benefit from them and let them be the influencer. We don't – So is that – you oh, work okay. with CPAs a lot? You have the, are they a referral source for you? Um, they're, uh, they're becoming a referral source. They're, mm-hmm. We have a CPA client. Um, they're becoming a referral source. We haven't used them a lot uh, So, for, But for this. His, historically, you go directly to the retailer. You we don't have a gate retailer. opener, right? No. We go directly to the retailer. So our tra- the same training we use for our salespeople, we use for the, the, the merchant. How to get past the gatekeeper. You right. Know, that's always a great <laughs> question. Um, and how to use influencers. We don't ask for referrals. We, we want an introduction. Mm-hmm. I'm not interested in somebody that doesn't know somebody giving me their name and phone number. I can get that out of the yellow pages. I want an influencer. I want an introduction to somebody. And an influencer is somebody that's going to give you that. They're going to tee it up for you in a in a positive way. So they have to have, be educated already about your 
what you do in an order in, to influence them, An right? influencer to me is somebody that sees value in our program and it's willing to share that value with somebody else. So mm-hmm. even if you didn't purchase my product, but through our consultation, we were able to show you how to, to make more money or capture money you're already losing, uh, and you're willing to influence somebody else to see me, that, that's what I'm looking for. I'm not really looking for referrals. So it's a very compelling idea, and you've got some 40 folks out there nationwide sharing this story. Are you growing? Are you hiring? Uh, oh, absolutely. Yeah? Absolutely. Oh, we have a job order with Georgia Works. We're always hiring salespeople. Yeah. Fantastic. Is it only here in Atlanta, or it's all over? Uh, we're in about um, eight different states, uh, but our main office is here in Atlanta, on, uh, here in Marietta. And right. this is where it started? Uh, for us, it is, yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. Where can our listeners go to learn more? Our, my phone number is 678-426-1506. Email is pretty simple. It's my name, Lloyd Lofton, L-L-O-Y-D-L-O-F-T-O-N, at yahoo.com. And our website is just our company name, American Eagle Financial Services.com. Uh, I learned a lot, but I'll tell you what really stuck with me is the if and how. You're going to hear that again. Right? <laughs> <laughs> You're definitely going to hear that, that again. How about hanging with us? We have one more guest we're going to visit with this Absolutely. morning. Absolutely. I've learned a lot, and I expect to learn more. All right. Next up on Results Matter Radio, we have with us Chartered Financial Consultant, Mr. Charles White. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Great show. I'm kind of feeling intimidated. I hope I can say something <laughs> intelligent here. <laughs> Talk back to on. follow. Yeah, you're, you're the headliner. You're <laughs> <laughs> so tell us a little bit about your day-to-day work, man. What are you out there trying to do for folks? Well, I've uh, decided to work in something called a PEO, Professional Employer Organizations. And if you get on an elevator and you're talking to a small businessman and he asks you what you're doing, you say PEO, Professional Employer Organization. His eyes roll back and he hopes the elevator will stop so he can get off. <laughs> but... What I'm finding out is I'm sure everybody, in the last four or five years, we've had more confusion over Medicare, uh, medical advantage plans, ACA. I hate to use that other word. (laughs) And small employers are just totally confused. Small employers I categorize as anywhere from five to 50 employees. And I saw a niche of what's called a PEO, professional employer organization, of going in and working with small businesses. You know, you, you typically have someone doing their payroll, someone doing their medical insurance, someone doing their 401k, someone doing their their uh, four, uh, their 125, all these other kind of things. A PEO can network and put all these things together in a pool. PEOs have been around for quite some time. Back in the 60s, they got started where they were working with small employers, primarily those were having a terrible time getting workers' compensations. So if you're a, a roofing company with eight or ten employees or a mechanic shop or something of that nature and you have to have workers' comp and you're looking at a, a ten-person company, the insurance carrier may not want you because you're a high risk. If I can pool you, if I can get ten companies that have ten employees, if I can get 20, 30, 40, 50 companies with ten employees, now I've got a big pool. And I can then go to that insurance carrier as a, as a, a PEO and negotiate some better rates because the risk is spread out longer bigger pool and what happened with the PEOs as you grow it's just like little Johnny has sells apples on the corner and all of a sudden somebody said well I wish you had apples and peaches too now he's got peaches on and on and on PEOs have grown they've grown from just taking care of what's called workers compensation to where they've added medical insurance more importantly I think is all the HR benefits that are available for it now is there certain um, types of businesses that that use this more than others or do you like a, do you have a sweet spot that's interesting. No, there is no real sweet spot. Uh, many of the PEOs that I, I, I'm working with are dealing with uh, doctor's offices, uh, CPA firms. A lot of them are working with that uh, Johnny's Auto Mechanic place. So it just depends upon mm-hmm. what they do. And, and in many cases, that PEO organization is kind of tuned into a particular niche or industry. So I don't particularly represent one. It's based upon what the need might be. Now, what's the pain that that individual organization is having where they go, i got to call Charles? Well, the pain might be trying to find a good quality employee group. I was in a company yesterday where I was talking to this lady, and they've been in business forever, and I was sharing with her some of the things we Mm -hmm. do, and I said, we have 401K and on and on and on. She said, oh, man, I I wish we'd have had a 401K, and she's getting older. So So they didn't have one. No, the pain is trying to find good quality employees that you can keep and retain Mm because you know the training is phenomenal. The pain is wondering what regulations I have to deal with is – Johnny crawls under that car. He's the best mechanic in the world, but somebody in the office there messes up, and he could be out of business tomorrow morning. So right. that's the unknown is the pain. You know? 
Well, it reminds me of uh, something Lloyd said early in his segment about these people, they got in business because they wanted to practice their craft or their physician or, or they're fixing cars. And the last thing that they're equipped to deal with is all of this regulation and legislation. I think the value of your service is that you combine it all. Correct. Uh, the problem with, with most small business owners is they'll have uh, maybe uh, three or four for, with different people of voluntary benefits but they'll have it through three or four different brokers or agents, and you're able to pull it all under. So they can make one phone call instead of four phone calls. Correct. And, and the PEO becomes kind of involved in their business to make sure that they're running it as good as they can, much like what you do. We want to make sure that they're happy, Granny, and so they'll refer us to other folk. Right. So walk us through the process, if you would, a little bit. Let's say you got Business Radio X. Mm -hmm. um, we have uh, four studios here, one in Wilmington, and we're about to have some in Birmingham, Athens, and Chicago. Here's, here's so, my card. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what is, walk us through I don't know, an engagement cycle. Or what, what happened? You sit down with us and walk us through what that looks like. I would sit down with you and say, look, you've got, as, as Lloyd said, you, you're, you've got all these different variables here you're working with. Let's sit down and put together a proposal, okay? Uh, give me the your some statistics on your people. Give me your workers' comp. Tell me if you had any losses last year. Give me that report. Are you do you have medical insurance? On and on and I would get all these details. And, and like Michael, together. he's kind of clumsy. So like, is he going to cost us more? Uh, <laughs> you might now that you said that. <laughs> very very clumsy. <laughs> Well, when you say that, that's always that possibility also. So so a PEO is going to be looking at that business. Do you have a, a Michael that's going to go out here and get weird, get drunk, and go wreck his car during business hours? <laughs> so we're, How we're does kinda, he know so much about you? <laughs> yeah, really? It isn't part of your service to make – I feel like I got a little bit of background check on that. Have <laughs> <laughs> you talked to them already? Charles yeah. did some pre-show research, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Isn't part of your service, though, making sure they've got the right products? Like if they have workers' comp, they don't have, a, for example, an admin person cl uh, in the wrong classification. Exactly. So we, we do that. We check it. We make sure. And you mentioned background checks. We can work on background checks. We can do all that stuff, make sure that you're a U.S. citizen, help that employer to when he's interviewing something, feel comfortable about who he's interviewing. So you're taking all those headaches off of my plate. Absolutely. Right? And letting us run the radio business, we right. got, which we're still figuring out. <laughs> we got if enough you find some guy in the radio, too, <laughs> that would be a great. bonus. I find a lot of small businesses also have that key employee that takes care of the hiring and the firing and the payroll and all that stuff. They're a key person, someone that they trust to the nines. Wouldn't it be great if you could free them of, of a lot of that responsibility by having an outside mm -hmm. service? To, and in many, many cases, that outside service can pool all that information together and pool those benefits together and actually save you money. Do you find that some of those business owners don't realize that that person they lean on is a key employee? Because that person's been there for so long, they just see them as like the picture in your living room, and someone says, hey, what a great picture, and you go, what picture? It's kind of like being <laughs> married for 40 years. You know? Yeah. No, that's that's true. You 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 take advantage of that person and their skills because you've had them all those years and oh my god what happens if they were to pass tomorrow morning and you don't have them anymore right. what happens if someone offered them a better job i hope karen's not listening <laughs> really? to today's broadcast <laughs> now now it sounds like you become like the company's hr department you, you basically are their hr department that's that's really in, in reality what a peo is a, pro, a professional employer organization and, and I, I didn't want to get into the negatives or what some of the people think, but when you when you talk to a f financial planner, CPAs, on and on and on, and you ask them what do they know about PEOs, it's amazing what they can come up with. And when you look at the history of any organization, group, or whatever, that they've got some background, a PEO, you wind up being a co-employer. Okay, let that sink in for a second, a co-employer. Huh. So let's say you're a radio station here. You've got 20 employees, okay? You have 20 employees. Now you hire us as your PEO. You have still 20 employees, but we co-own those employees so that we can get you the best rates on the workers' comp so we can do your HR work and we can do those kind of things, okay? So if I go out there just in the market by myself, I'm not going to get – first of all, I don't know what I'm doing. But even if I knew what I was doing, I'm not going to have these uh, economies of scale, these benefits of pooling and all that, all that kind of thing, much less the payroll and all that, and all that stuff, right? Correct. Now, one of the things, too, that in a little sidebar, when I was out in Nevada where I used to live before I moved here, uh, I was talking to a little company that had not worked with the PEO, and there was a good – I think it was a roofing company. He, he he would get on Friday afternoons. They would shut down, and about three thirty, four o'clock, they'd all get together, have some beer and some pizzas and stuff like that, and they, they'd work until 5 o'clock. So they run out of beer or something, and they go out to the store to get something, and all of a sudden that guy has an automobile accident on company time. Ruh -ruh. Whoa, that's not good. 
as a PEO, we sit down and we counsel and we talk about those kind of things. Uh, you get an employee that uh, says, hey, my, my son goes to karate class uh, three nights a week, and, and it's inconvenient for me to go home and then come back, and this actually happened. Can I stay until 6 o'clock? You know, but the employer says, yeah, good, I don't care. Five o'clock shut out time. If you've got something you want to do, fine. So three of the and four of the employees stay there, and they work on this, they work on that, they do this, they do that. And uh, heaven forbid you let that employee go, and he sues you for overtime that he didn't get. One of you go to court, the court says, do you have, can we see your employee handbook? Employee what? Aye, aye, aye. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So these are the things that, that, that the PEO is going to do as your HR department is help you put all these things together. And, and you're incented because you're a co-owner of that employee. You're a co-owner of that employer, employer employee. And, and the thing that we don't talk a lot about because you don't want to raise the flag up too high is that there is a liability on the part of the PEO. So if that guy goes out here at 4 o'clock half drunk because he's going to get some beer for the company and has a wreck, that PEO is partly responsible on risk, and, and the PEO will have a liability policy in play, and that in itself is worth a fortune. So you mentioned at the very top of the conversation, when you first meet the, the man or woman in the elevator and broach this subject, they don't all hug you and say, where you been all my life? So how does the sales and marketing piece of, of what you do work? Water dripping on a rock, getting on a radio show, talking with people who know CPAs. Man, I'm everybody <laughs> wants to know Debbie. Yeah, yeah no kidding. <laughs> she is Miss Popular in here. I'll tell well, you She that. does have a face for radio. <laughs> I'm a non-practicing CPA, and I belong to the North Georgia CPA Association. Oh, I go to their meetings. I, I try to network and schmooze up as much as I can, be totally involved uh, in the chamber, the Greater Hall. Uh, chamber of Commerce is one of the best in Georgia. I'm very much involved in that, so you try to get your name out there and then get that elevator speech where he'll listen to you for a few minutes. So because you want to get in front of as many employers of five or more employees, Yes, right? sir. Yeah. That's your bottom line. Right. Most of the PEOs, if you look at the national average, they average about 10 employees, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that's the sweet spot, the 10 to 15 employees. So where can our listeners go to learn more? Do what now? Where can our listeners go to learn more? Do you have a website? Oh, okay. Um, I don't have a website because I work with a number of PEOs, but you can give me a call at uh, Charles White, 770-380-9727. As again, Debbie said, let me repeat that, 770-380-9727. I also have, if you call me, I have a white paper from a, a well-known organization called Employer Professional Employer Organizations Fueling Small Businesses, which will give you about an eight-page uh, uh, briefing on how the PEOs work. And oh, is, yeah. the, is there an email then? Do you have uh, some way online for someone to get a hold of you? They can get a hold of me at charles at ltciga dot com, long term care insurance, Georgia dot com. My other passion is long term care insurance. Well, and I can't let you go without mentioning uh, you're no stranger to radio work. If, if, well, in fact, two or three people here have done radio stuff, right? But you were telling me before we went on air, you've. You've been a radio host, or you are a radio host? Let's I had a radio show at Bernal University for a little over three years, and before uh -huh. that I had a show in Brunswick. Uh, so, yeah, and, and when she came on, I felt like leaving because I <laughs> – how does she enunciate those words so quickly, you know? <laughs> well, and, and you mentioned, right, you have radio background, and I Lloyd, do. don't you? I did a cable TV show in Knoxville, Tennessee. Goodness gracious. I man. won't do TV. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we could just do one of those shows, like was it the Fox Five or whatever? We could just we could have our own show, all wow. five of us. <laughs> what do you think? All right, so one more time, I don't want it to get lost in the fray. Let's make sure that uh, people have your your phone number and an email or website. Yeah, it's Charles White seven seven zero three eight zero nine seven two seven. My email is Charles at l t c i g a dot com. All right. Well, thank you all for being part of the show today. This is Lee Cantor for Stone Payton, and uh, special thanks to Burr and Foreman for sponsoring this episode of Results Matter Radio. This has been a joint production of Burr and Foreman and Business Radio X. Burr and Foreman is a full-service law firm with offices across the Southeast. If results matter to you and you want them to matter to your law firm, please give Burr and Foreman a call at 404 685 4337. For more information and to find the right attorney for you, visit burr.com. That's B-U-R-R dot -R com. 